Welcome to the Pearl Diver Seminars uh, of Buckminster College and uh, Clea of the Free University in Brussels. Today, uh, it will be a fantastic seminar. <laughs> the famous Belgian author of fantasy literature, Penny Stewart, and also our future uh, teacher or preceptress, uh, teacher of fantasy. Uh, I, I say future because we are a future school. So <laughs> once once there is a school, there will be there will be classes in in fantasy, and, and Penn is already uh, already ready to uh, to start uh, teaching teaching that. So uh, Penn, uh, you will be like saying uh, something about fantasy and how important it is, right? So yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so the floor is yours, please. Thank you for introducing. So I'm Ben Stewart, and I, as Marta said, I write fantasy. Um, I came to, uh, into contact with Marta through an article um, in the newspapers about the Buckminster Project, and I was actually immediately interested in it um, because I was also thinking about a lot of uh, ways to teach writing, and I was also uh, teaching fantasy writing to adults. And uh, now I also wanted to teach it to young people because when I started to write fantasy, that's about 14 years ago, uh, it was just about the writing, you know? I um, I didn't really wonder why I was writing fantasy, why this genre, or even why I started writing because before I always painted. But in the years that followed, and when I learned to write fantasy better than I did uh, in the beginning, I actually also started to yeah, wonder about a lot of things. Uh, for example, why indeed did I uh, choose this genre? Why was I so attracted to it? Um, what was the meaning of this genre in the world? What was the purpose of it? Uh, what did I experience uh, when I am writing? Um, and those were a lot of, of things to think about, actually. And then at a certain point, I got a scholarship from Flanders Literature, and uh, they said that it could help to actually launch uh, the genre in Flanders, because we're still a very niche. Um, and I even started to think more about education, teaching, uh, writing, helping other people. And by doing that, by working together with other authors, uh, this thinking process uh, started to, you know, become still, I was still thinking further and further about the writing and what it really means for people uh, out of the experience of teaching towards young people, adults. Um, there's a lot coming back uh, when you teach writing and you, uh, you read what your students uh, have written. Um, a lot of it is comes from the person itself, from the things that actually uh, triggers them. So I started to think, what does it mean? And um, then there was this other aspect of high giftedness, which I was really interested in. And I started to see that maybe there were few connections. And in those connections and the thinking process that led to it, um, I'm going to take you with me uh, in the following hour. So. I have the first slide is well welcome, of course. And today, so I want to talk with you about the power of the fantastic genre. For me, it is one of the really most important genres to ever that we can write ever in our life, uh, especially when we are like intrigued by the world and the problems of the world. And I'm going to explain why I think that. So I have some five topics. I want to talk uh, to you today. So the first one is uh, the influence of scientific inventions and discovery on our imagination and storytelling. Yes, it was one of the first things that I actually saw in uh, studying fantasy, but also in studying fantasy uh, in the history and the history of fantasy. Um, I did a few uh, readings about that, and then so I had to do some research, and I started to see some things. The second point uh, I'm going to talk about is um, how we are actually are overcoming our biologically limited view of reality, and how that, again, 
at its turn is influencing our imagination and uh, the stories that we tell. So then the third one is actually the link between the interest in high giftedness, urgency in all kinds of situations and the imaginative genre. Then I'm going to talk about how can we use the genre and genre writing to train executive function uh, in high gifted uh, people. And how can our imagination be transformed when we are writing and reading uh, fiction? And then how we can use it? What is actually, uh, yeah, I would say the, the core trait of the fantasy genre. So the first is a few scientific inventions. Um, yeah, you see the some, some clockwork gear that I have there. And this is a very important uh, circle. So what I noticed, uh, I start in the 19th century. Why? Because in the 19th century is actually, that's the start of what we call the, the classic fantasy genre. Before that, we had a historical fantasy genre, like myths and legends. Uh, I'm thinking about Roman and Greek myths, for example, uh, all kind of religious tales, uh, the Gilgamesh uh, epos, and all this kind of stuff. But in the 19th century, a few really important things are happening. Um, we are getting more scientific exploration. There were a lot of discoveries in the 19th century on all kinds of um, disciplines in life and, and in the world. Uh, for example, the invention of train and the railroad, the railroad uh, which changed a lot. Uh, new weapons were invented. Uh, they were trying to um, do some uh, work on, um, on, uh, the, on the medical side uh, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but it led to something really very important, and it was the beginning of the industrialization that started in England. And that actually also, together with that, in England, we uh, have the birth of uh, classical fantasy. And there were a lot of uh, sorts of fantasy tales, um, because you had some friction between science and religion in this 19th century. Uh, just imagine Darwin and, he, and his whole research project and the church, which wasn't really happy with that, um, is one example of it, but there were many. Um, and that, uh, that resulted in movements, movements pro-science, movements pro-religion, some who actually truly longed uh, for the time with, where not everything was explained eh, or explainable. And there was some sort of romanticism. You saw it in art, you saw it in architecture, you had the, the revival of the Gothic. Um, and that romanticism also led to um, a lot of, for example, in London, there were like a hundred uh, occult societies who were busy with um, all kind of, of life uh, be, be after that, uh, ghosts, uh, specters, all this kind of stuff. Um, but there were, of course, also writers. Uh, one, for example, was in the horror fantasy uh, genre, like Frankenstein. Yes, that's one thing. Um, we also had the more scientifically um, fantasy, maybe even science fiction, we can say. I'm thinking about uh, Jules Verne in that part. And you can, maybe if you have uh, have read, uh, was it the... the, the Traveling of Captain Nemo, eh, 1,000 1, miles under the sea. Um, then you, you have all this, this uh, writing about the wonders of the technology, the wonders of how we can have this uh, underwater ship, how we can uh, maybe dive. And they have this apparatus that make, it, just, uh, make it possible that we can breathe underwater and all this kind of stuff, which he was writing about. And then, of course, we had the more religious part, as I said, the specters, uh, also supernatural beings. For example, Dracula, the, he, the whole vampire genre came to life in that age. But also Alice in Wonderland, for example, it's, it's, it's all 19th century and even a lot more than that. Um, and together with that, we see actually the first research on giftedness. Uh, or the opposite, uh, the less gifted were researched and there we, people were thinking, what can we do with these people? How does it actually work? Why uh, can some people uh, think more and, and solve uh, problems better than others? And there was an interest in it. But what is very important for me as a writer is this, this, this clockwork gear. You also always see there was a, some, some kind of dreaming about uh, solutions, 
for problems. So there were, pro of course, in the 19th century, there were a lot of problems. Uh, for example, um, uh, there were much more people than before. So in the cities, everybody went to the city. London had a lot of overpopulation. Um, the house uh, houses were really in bad condition. Uh, the quality of the air was really bad. So they were thinking about solutions and imagining about that, dreaming about it. And sometimes they thought about a certain solution. Other people started to think about it. And then even other people started to invent things that maybe, yes, we can find actually a solution for this problem. Um, and it's a bit like clockwork. It it's all works together. It's all the kind, different kind of people with different kinds of thinking. But it's influencing the, the the one they are always influencing each other and it takes of course you see all these uh, these clockwork gears it takes an engine um and for me the engine as as i look at history it's always it's challenges uh challenges because of change because of threats because of urgency whatever that's actually the engine and when this comes into society the, these urge to find a solution for a problem at the same time you see um interest in high giftedness and in intelligence and there is more research uh, so this was something that i really saw in this 19th century and so i looked on how did it uh, develop in the 20th century uh, oh i have another this is an example yes this is really <laughs> fun thing uh, electric bo uh, bobs a big black ostrich this is one of the examples on how you can they actually also write stuff that is completely uh wild and um yeah th this is really a fun thing it's about um it's one of five uh, short stories by robert tombs it's written in 1892 and it's about uh the real name of electric bob is robert morse so he was a descendant of the inventor of the telegraph samuel morse and he was actually traveling around in the i think in the african deserts in the west yes and he was searching uh, for a big gold mine and you see the ostrich and there are actually machine guns in his chest and so he can shoot his enemies and uh, then uh, yeah hopefully they, they could find gold so <laughs> this is actually it's a, a sub genre of fantasy which we call uh, steampunk but um then they go really wild in uh, fantasizing about machinery and steam engine and all the victorian stuff so I really found this uh, a very uh, fun example of uh, how far this can lead, actually, in this way. It, it can go, go completely absurd. <laughs> Maybe I've seen a lot of stuff like that, uh, but it's just fun. Um, then in the 20th century, uh, we actually see a bit uh, the same. So I left the clockwork gear here, but in the 20th century, we have uh, two world wars, actually. And that influenced also a lot. Uh, it was the driving force behind the development of machinery, weapons, all kind of inventions that actually today, some of them we still use uh, in a better way, of course, than we used them uh, during the, the world wars. But you see the same thing. The fantastic genre, again, was growing. Uh, not so much in Belgium, uh, although we had the first steps we had something that is called um, Vlaamse filmpjes which were really small books uh, this still exists uh, it's I mean it, I think it started in the 30 1930s something like that and this was actually the first publication uh, of a lot of authors because every small book uh, was written by a different author and there you see really a lot of uh, fantastic genre writing in it even today and another one was a book that was published, uh, Wondere Vertelsels. And uh, that was a book a bit like the tales of uh, Grimm and Anderson, uh, who came from Germany, but in some kind of Flemish version. Um, but in the US, we saw uh, other stuff, uh, stuff that we know today very, very much. We had Marvel, we have DC Comics, uh, Peter Pan also, for example, was written as well. This is really the 30s, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, a lot between the two world wars. But it's just after the Second World War uh, that we see uh, actually the birth of modern fantasy. And that starts with uh, Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings. But then 
he's followed by many, many other authors who want to try to write like Tolkien. You have Terry Brooks and many others in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. And then again, after the World Wars, we see a lot of uh, scientific development, especially in the 50s and 60s. Uh, 1957, Sputnik starts, which is actually a trigger for America to run for the moon. And in 1969, they will land on the moon. It was in 1961 that uh, the American president said that in this decade, we want to go to the moon. But the first science fiction movie that was ever made was in 1902. And that was, it was called A Trip to the Moon. And maybe, perhaps you have ever seen it. It's like, uh, you see the, the moon with the face, and then there's like this big bullet in the eye of the moon. It's a really a famous image of, the, of this first movie. So we were already dreaming about going to, to the moon in, in the first sci-fi movie. You know, it would take more than 60 years to actually achieve it, but we did it. So again, the connection, imagination, realization. Um, so again, the high gift in research. You see a lot of research in the 60s and then in the 80s, and you see it today again. So why today again? Because today we are confronted with a lot of problems again. Um, not so much war, although today we do have a war again. Uh, but uh, especially the climate change and all the disasters that are happening are challenging us more than in the past decades to find solutions. And then we see again new interest in high giftedness. And also again in fantasy writing, because if you look at uh, the United States and the film industry, much of the movies that are made today are fantasy. Uh, it's really, it's, it's a million dollar industry in the, in the States. And it's spreading now also all over the world because um, in the, the former century, it was especially the English speaking part of the world that was really publishing a lot of fantasy. Uh, today, we see actually fantasy from a lot of other countries as well. Uh, for example, Kenya, Africa, um, Russia even, and China. There is fantasy published there today, and it also gets translated. It's, we didn't see that uh, 20 years ago. So that's new, and it's it's growing. It's still growing. So for yeah, in 1983, there's also the publication in the United States of A Nation at Risk. It's about uh, the sister, the teaching system. And there in this note, uh, was already uh, a note about high giftedness and about high gifted students and how they had the right uh, to get proper education that uh, fitted the high giftedness. Um, so also this you saw happening. And then this is really a fine one. Um, the 21st century, this century, for example, this book was published a few weeks ago uh, the author is George van Hall. He is a journalist of uh, the Volkskrant in the Netherlands. Um, he writes about science and everything. So he published this book and the title says it all, From Lightsaber to Time Machine, how science is working on technology from, among others, Star Wars, Star Trek, and the Marvel Universe. And one of the best examples is actually what we are doing here now at this moment, because uh, I think... Maybe you uh, you remember as as a kid, maybe if you were watching Star Trek, they were actually like talking uh, to each other with a video screen, and then was wow, it was amazing. So and look at us now, yes, that's one of the best examples that we have. Um, but science is uh, yes is researching on all the things that writers once imagined or movie makers did. Uh, we want to explore the universe. We want to go to Mars and other planets. We are imagining how we can live on the moon, how we can live on Mars. So we're really working on that. Now, the second thing that I found a very interesting one is um, we are actually quite limited in the way we see the reality among us. If we just look at us as human beings, uh, only having our eyes and our ears and, and, and taste and, and everything, uh, we cannot see what happens on the moon, not just with our body, I mean, yes, we, we cannot see that. And 
all these scientific inventions has made, a, made it possible for us to actually overcome this uh, biologically limited view. Um, for example, and it's uh, yeah, the last century, and there has been influential on authors as well. Um, one of, of the uh, examples, uh, the, the way we are able to see the world shapes our uh, imaginative storytelling. And then I, I think about the microscope to the James Webb telescope and everything in between. Just imagine uh, the time before the microscope existed. Couldn't we uh, make stories about microscopic life? Maybe we could think about it. Maybe we could think that it possibly could exist, but we didn't know for sure before the, tel the microscope was there. Um, the same way as the James Webb telescope now is broadening our view on the universe, the way we have never seen it before, and just makes us, it, it leads to a lot of new theories about the universe. So we are again thinking and imagining and researching because of these images. Um, another example, um, once upon a time, this, this, this was um, a TV series by French animator, Albert Barilly, and it was about the human body. And maybe you have seen it as a child. You have this, this white blood cells and the red blood cells, and then you have the evil viruses uh, where they had to fight against. Uh, we would never be able to tell such a story without the microscope. You see, so this is what I what I mean. Um, so it's a bit like a chain of influence in the use of imagination and stories and the scientific research, and it goes uh, back and forth between the two. And then it's uh, also something that I noticed was that these things trigger uh, those who actually are already attracted to imaginative thinking, the geeks, for example. If I look, uh, if I'm, I'm on a fantasy fair, like facts, for example, in Ghent, and you talk with the people who are visiting that, uh, I can assure you there are a lot of professors among them. <laughs> and and really people who, who want to, to tell stories and do scientific research and are inspired by all the imagination that you can see there. So, so for me, um, there's really a link between uh, the emphasis in high giftedness, the urgency, and the imaginative uh, genre. Today, so I said uh, climate change, climate fiction, and dreaming of living on Mars. That's one thing. Uh, and then we see something like SpaceX. Now, I don't know if you know, but uh, Elon Musk was really a big fan of sci-fi literature when he was young. He is actually inspired by Isaac Asimov's work uh, to do what he's doing today. So again, you see this connection, this inspiring, uh, being inspired by the imagination of writers and then the engineer, then the scientists that work with it. Um, Again, we see new interest in giftedness and research in uh, giftedness. And we see the new interest in fantasy and sci-fi. Mm -hmm. So now how can we use um, genre writing to train executive function? Uh, you know, when um, you have uh, high intelligence uh, young people, quite often they do not need to make a lot of planning or organization or whatever because uh, all the all what they, they learn is going really easy uh, so sometimes and quite often they do not develop these uh, talents enough uh, so how can we use uh, writing for that well if i write um in the beginning i was really uh, organically writing which means i had this idea i started writing and well we will see where we end something like that um so quite soon I realized that that's not really uh, the ideal way of writing a, a fantasy work uh, or sci-fi. Uh, because if you work like that, you make a lot of mistakes and it's only creativity that is flowing and it's flowing and it's flowing and it's taking you everywhere and sometimes really into the wrong direction. And then you start uh, rereading it and you see a lot of things which are no longer logically. Um, which do not uh, fit into the story, uh, the style, the character development. There are so many things you have to think about. And so I had a lot of work because I had to rewrite it every time. So uh, during that process, in these years of writing, I started to actually, um, yeah, prepare a bit better. 
let's say, think, uh, about story think about the storyline, think about the character development, think about how the story would end, how I would get there uh, way up front before I, I started writing. But then um, here you have this, this little picture of uh, the one day in the life of a writer. And it's really like that. Um, it's also really a personal test uh, for your, um, how do you know, your self-esteem, really. Sometimes you have days that things are going really good, and then there are days that are going really bad. And then you read something, and say, oh, okay, that's brilliant. And maybe then somebody then gives some kind of comment, and you think, oh, my God, it's really bad. And so <laughs> it goes big, like, up and down like that. Uh, you, you need to, yeah, you, you need to learn to handle that you know, just emotionally. And when you are published, it's even worse because you will always fail. And because there will always be somebody, some reader that will not love what you have written. There will always be somebody who really doesn't like your book or your story. Um, so a lot of, of skills that you need to write something is planning, time, deadlines, um, even if it's for uh, schoolwork or it's for a publisher, but you will have to finish the thing. You will have to finish the job. So you will uh, have to show perseverance. Uh, you will have to apply structure. You will work on world building and magic. And if you do that, it's logic and reason because you want to sell something to a reader that really does not exist. And everybody knows that it doesn't exist. And yet it needs to feel logically and uh, the, the reader, he needs to believe that it's real, although he knows it's not real. So, um, as I said, you will fail. You will always fail. So when you are afraid of failing, this is really training you in how you can learn how to fail. Um, you will have to do some research, uh, especially when you write science fiction, uh, because things are developing so fast at this moment that when you write science fiction, there is a really huge possibility that within a few years, um, reality will keep up with you and uh, it will mean no longer significant what you ever wrote or thought about. Um, it will trigger and need intrinsic motivation, which is a very important one, um, because if you do not that trigger the intrinsic motivation to write, you will never finish your book. It's really hard to actually finish the book. And by finishing the book, I do not mean the first version, which is already hard enough, but then you need to rewrite it and do the editing and then all you will have to rewrite it, maybe not 10 times, but 20 times, 30 times. And maybe then there will still be mistakes. And you will, yeah, you will be, you have to keep going, you know? And that's not, uh, that's not easy. So perseverance, it's a training and perseverance. And it's one thing for a short story, but if you want to write an entire book, it takes a lot more perseverance. If you want to write an mm -hmm. entire series of books, then certainly you will have to uh, apply a lot of perseverance. Discipline is another one. There is always something that will distract you and that will give you a reason not to work. You know, not to engage yourself uh, in that book and write that book and keep writing. You will have to be disciplined. So it's a training and discipline. And it's a safe space. As long as you're writing on your own computer, nobody is reading it. And it's really the first edition. It's a totally safe space. So uh, you can imagine anything you want. You can write anything you want. There's a, no good way, no bad way in that first uh, draft that you write. So that's really the safe space. So all this stuff um, are things that you learn when you write. And I, th I think even more with fantasy and sci-fi, because I always call it writing 2.0. You know, um, it's very simple. When you are writing about our world, it's quite easy to imagine it's quite easy to find the right words you do not need that much research but if you're writing about living on mars on a base yeah that takes a lot more research it takes a lot more uh imagining simply you have to imagine you use your imagination much more to how would that be uh that's this this is what jules Verne did you know so just imagining sometimes really wildly um imagining not only what the problems are going to be, but also what the solutions are going to be and the problems that will give maybe between people who are living there. 
And it's not only the technical part of it, it's the entire part of it, because if you have human characters, there are humans. So let's say we, we are on Mars, uh, they will have to deal with really, really hard uh, circumstances, uh, psychological problems, maybe, you know, and as a writer, you have to think about all of that, not just uh, how uh, technically I'm going to build my rockets to uh, go to Mars. But once you are there, how are you going to live there? How are you going to survive there? What if things go really wrong? Uh, the movie The Martian is a really good example of that. Uh, the, I don't know if you have seen it, but then it's about an astronaut and he um, he's left behind on Mars and everybody thinks he's dead. He's not. And he does everything that he can to survive and he has to use his imagination and scientific knowledge and everything to let the earth know that he's still alive, that they have to come and get him. So real, that's really good work. And it's also based on a book of a writer. <laughs> so there we are again. Um, one of the things, uh, forms of writing that you can do to tra uh, to train that and, and young people, we did that. There was, the, the you remember the flash, uh, flash fiction writing session we had about the octopus. Um, it's really flash fiction is something that you write a short story, a very short story um, in a very short time. And you limit your research possibilities. So you only uh, yeah, you only use what you know and your imagination. So no research, nothing that can help you. You have to save yourself literally in the story. Uh, it's quite challenging and it can trigger your imagination. Um, and for every human, it, it's it's something completely different. If you we have seen that, if you do the exercise, everything writes, uh, everybody writes something completely different. And it was very interesting to see what uh, we all wrote uh, uh, after the the exercise. It gives you full freedom, and that is also very important. The full, the, the completely the entire freedom is also an engine for imagination and. Um, it's also a possibility, possibility to choose what you are passionate about, uh, about what you really, really love. Uh, again, intrinsic motivation uh, is triggered there. So then we have the books and the short stories. Uh, so I'm also working on uh, this kind of projects, uh, for example, with uh, authors in residence projects. Uh, it, uh, we have to uh, work for a finished product after 20 hours. Um, so uh, I look always at the interests of students, what kind of uh, things are they studying? Uh, in this case, it will be about caretaking for older people. So we're going to make something that they can use in caretaking for the older people. Um, so it will maybe be a short story or maybe we will uh, make something that they can go and read together with uh, the elder ones. I don't know, but it will be something completely new again. Um, so if you write, you have the flash fiction, but you can also use uh, short stories and you can make a book full of short stories. <laughs> Those are two different things. Um, again, other uh, talents will be challenged. Um, if you write a short story, it's uh, more about, how can I say, the the small things in life and not so, as much as the big things in life. If you have these really big stories with, let's say, uh, an entire uh, dystopian government that you want to throw over or something, then you need a book, not a short story. But if I am writing about how such a regime can uh, influence the relationship with my child or partner, for example, then I can use a short story. You see, this is entirely different. Um, when you write a book full of short stories, you also have to, uh, yeah, have to be uh, pay attention to the subject of the stories, uh, how they follow, um, are they connected to each other, what message do they give when you have read the entire book full of short stories? It's not just uh, any stories that you mix. And if you write one book with one big story. Um, that's also very important. Again, you have to think about other things. 
the big story, for example, if I want this dystopian environment and I want to um, topple the government over, then one book is okay, but I will have to think about the big structure of the world and then the characters again. If I write a series, it's even more complex because then every book uh, has, has to be a really important uh, part of the character arc and the story arc of the entire series. And every book has to be also uh, a story on its own, a complete story. So you have to plan it really top down. You will have to even more than for one book or uh, a bunch of short stories, uh, you have to plan actually and you have to think before you start writing otherwise um, there's a huge possibility that uh, you will not finish your series you know um if you're writing sci-fi you will have to do a lot of research so as i already said and uh, another very interesting thing is writing project with other students together uh why because um if they, for example, have to read their, each other's stories that they have written, um, that's much more interesting than, you know, uh, uh, get a book in the library or something from a writer that they don't know. They can read a story from their friends, uh, but they will have to give feedback and they will have to accept feedback. So that's something that they need to learn. Uh, how do you do that? F give feedback so that the other one uh, doesn't think like, oh, my God, I'm a disaster. I'm never going to write again. And you know, and how do you give feedback so that uh, your other friend um, doesn't think it? So that's also all kind of skills that you are training with this kind of projects. Um, so uh, my last uh, point, how can uh, our imagination be transformed now by reading and writing genre fiction? Um, this was really a very important one because you need all, the, all what I told before uh, to come to this. Um, as a writer, when I was thinking this entire process, I uh, suddenly came up with the idea, actually, as writers, we are farmers of thoughts. Um, what, I, do I, what do I mean with that? I write something and you read it. And what I write is about something I'm thinking about, something I'm worrying about, some problem that I want to solve, perhaps. And I actually transfer transfer my thoughts through the story to you. And then you can do something with that, or you can do nothing with it, or you can start thinking about something. Um, I think as a writer, we are really responsible of which kind of seeds we plant in other ones' heads. Uh, but we can never be responsible for what grows out of it, you know? Um, a very nice uh, mm -hmm. uh, sentence that I once heard was from uh, Neil Gaiman. And he said, we are actually like dandelions. So you have the dandelion and it blooms. And then the bowl of seed is formed. Then the wind blows and all the seeds are just floating away with wind. And they are dropped somewhere, you know, and you don't know where. Maybe it will be on stone and they will never bloom. Or maybe they will be in really a fertile uh, soil and they will bloom perfectly, you know. Uh, you don't know that. But we are responsible for what we plant. And that's something to really think about. Um, now, this is what I told, okay. Once that you read, um, so you actually take in the, the, the thinking of others, of the writer for a bit. And uh, the question is, what will the high gifted brain do with that? Um, I know that scientists were uh, researching uh, quite a long time on where actually uh, the center of imagination in the brain is localized. Um, they couldn't find it and it really took them a long time. And then uh, someday I was reading an article that they said that we have found it. It's actually not just one center, it's actually its entire brain and how all these other centers are working together and how they are connected, actually. Um, now, this I found really interesting. Why? Because um, 
we knew our, our brain is really a really flexible thing. It can develop even at a uh, later age. It can develop uh, new connections. Um, so I was thinking maybe the high uh, high gifted brain, we know there are more connections. We know the, the connections are shorter and more efficiently formed. Uh, so actually the connection between all this, these centers is probably working a bit faster maybe. Uh, but um, maybe in a sort of kind of deeper thinking. And that is also what I uh, noticed when I was guiding uh, writers and people who are attracted to fantasy are quite often um, high gifted. And um, I talked also, also with a lot of people about it, but can this be? Uh, I just, I seem to notice this, but uh, uh, was there any research uh, uh, on that domain, uh, there's not not a lot not research done on this, uh, so it's something. But they they also said yes, we actually have noticed the same. If we are uh, working with a uh, high gifted young people, really really often they are interested in fantasy in sci-fi, um, and we're not actually the only ones. Um, I talked about Neil Gaiman. Um, it's, it's, I think, now 10 or 15 years ago that he gave a speech uh, in an interview, and he told about um, that he was invited to China, and it was the China Science Fiction Convention, and that he, he found this very strange because the years before, China was never interested in science fiction, they never wanted it, and then suddenly that changed, and uh, Neil asked um, the organizer, why is that? And he said, well, we are doing research and how actually visionaries are formed, visionaries like Elon Musk, um, because we do not have them. Uh, we produce a lot of things, but actually these kind of visionaries with this wild imagination doing this crazy thing sometimes like Elon Musk is doing, um, we don't have them. How does that come? They did a lot of research on a lot of people. And they actually found only one uh, difference uh, between how they uh, grow up in, in, in America and in China and uh, the differences between the education, universities are good. I mean, that was not, uh, not any significant difference. But um, people like Elon Musk, they were, oh, all of them were sci-fi sci readers and fantasy readers, and they were really a fan of that. Uh, so they thought... Somehow, this kind of um, of stories uh, trigger their mind to even more develop this imagination and to train the imagination. And then uh, we get people um, that can truly be visionaries. So today in China, um, a lot of sci-fi is written and it is also translated. Um, think about the tree body problem, for example which was really a big hit. I still need to read it, but, uh, and others will follow. So um, sci-fi is uh, is really going hard these days. Um, and then I have this last uh, slide, um, writing, that, that's really, we, we as writers, we say, are you in the flow? Are you in a writing flow? Like really, it's, it's, it's the imagination is running and oh yes, uh, your fingers can hardly follow your thoughts. Uh, I have that really, <laughs> because it's really an image running in my head. It's really like a film. Um, and that's a bit like uh, the flow uh, model strategy uh, here from me. <laughs> and it's a, a really difficult name. Um, I'm not gonna going to pronounce it. No, no, it's not to be pronounced. No, but... Not to be pronounced, but <laughs> you need a lot of research. Uh, but it's about encourage concentration. Yes, you have that when you're writing. Uh, the immersion, you are really diving into the story, into your imagination. Uh, it's risk-taking. Sometimes what you write is risky. You know, some people will maybe uh, up against it or not be happy with what you're writing. Uh, you're making a contribu contribu contribution to the world. And yes, it provides a challenge uh, to finish it, to think about everything in the story. So it's, uh, yeah, it's um, the creative brain that is doing everything that it actually needs to do when you are making the story. Um, and I think also because of the freedom that you have, um, you're really triggering, uh, especially high gifted people with their intrinsic motivation because they are free to do what they want. They can uh, 
take on any challenge that they want to take on. Uh, there's no limit. Uh, you can imagine everything that you want to imagine in your story. So um, this was my presentation. And I hope um, that we can do something with that. And we can think about in detail uh, in, in how, what form that we can uh, uh, work this out with uh, with the students. Um, yeah, so if there are questions, let's go. <laughs> you know, this, this, this series is, is called Pearl Divers and I have, you know, like I have this thought, okay, this is, this is one of the, of the pearls really, you know, like what you are bringing. It's, uh, it's really essential, you know, those connections that you make and mm -hmm. This is exactly, you know, that like, exactly the, the thing. So I, I'm I'm really thrilled listening listening to you. And you know, like when you I'm I'm not so sure, like you 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 it's a nice story you build. Oh, and, and here the technology and here the research and giftedness, and here the new technology, and then here it is. So I, I'm not so sure like you can like argue correlation, you know, like causation, I mean, but uh but uh, it's it's absolutely like you know, like uh, it's obvious that you know, like uh, one of the features of, of people who are uh, kind of neurologically dense, I would, I would say, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, is the, the, uh, this, this thing about the transcendence of the conventional dichotomies in thinking, yes? And in, in thinking, one of the, like, the <laughs> thinking, like, you know, like, uh, creative activity, like, work activity, education, and so on, one of the strongest dichotomies is between this, you know, like, technological, you know, logical, organized, you know, and uh, and kind of math and science side, yes, and, you know, fantasy, you know, imagination, language, and, and so on and so on. This is one of the strongest, you know, like kind of division or, or like, more like lateralization thing, you know, in, in, in thinking. Yes. And, and when you, and, and, you know, like, no wonder that people who have like, you know, like enough, enough connections, you know, like more, you know, like play with those, you know, in, in, inter interconnection between those things, and in, in fantasy, in what you what you say, you know, it's such a such a brilliant uh, uh, example and an opportunity for actually thinking across those those you know the divisions, yes, and and working them out, and uh, we we are searching for like uh, themes that will connect classes. And this is one of the of the features of, of the curriculum that, that we want to have is that whatever people are doing in the separate classrooms, it comes together. Yes. And yes. fantasy, you know, science fiction is like it's a brilliant platform for that, you know. Yes, it you is. You do the math, you do the physics, you do the you know, language writing, you yes. do the historical research, let's put it together and make a story of it, yes. Yes, that's it. Amazing connector, you know? Yes. And it's also because um when you see I don't know, problems are solved or there are these brilliant inventions, what you always see, it's not just somebody alone that is doing that. It's always people working together and people with different kinds of talents. Uh, you will need somebody who's indeed really practical. You will need somebody who is really a creative thinker. And, and if you put them together, you can see these, these two parts and, and even more. You go to an interaction with each other and lifting each other up. Yes. And this is what you can do with, with the fantasy writing. Yes. And plus all the other skills that you are uh, that you are training. Uh, because it, uh, I told you, it's really hard uh, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and even as a published author, it's really hard uh, because you will face a lot of problems uh, with publishers, practical things that you need to solve. Um, economics, uh, sales numbers, <laughs> really this kind of stuff you're confronted with. So that's another part, uh, which is also, uh, yes, asks, asks a lot of perseverance. Yes, it is. Um, and one of, of the, the good things that also I was reading was uh, the sentence that the creative arts, yeah, you can use them as a vehicle, as a motor for teaching and practicing the creative thinking. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's, it's exactly that. And it's not not just imagination. Uh, you can use it also um, in a, a medical way. Um, for example, a few yeah, a few months ago, I, th I think, I uh, visited a psychiatric uh, hospital, and I wrote fantasy with people uh, who were suicidal, 
uh, young people uh, from 12 to 18 years who were um, intern in the hospital. Uh, and I was a bit scared to actually do that. It was really a big step um, because th those are really vulnerable, vulnerable kids. And uh, yeah, I thought, oh, I have to be careful uh, not to write about uh, too bad uh, stuff or dying or whatever, or war. Uh, so I developed a writing ex exercise about somebody that they had to save. And um, there came so much positive response of them. Uh, it were people, some were high gifted also, some also had uh, ASS or HDAD or ADD together. Uh, some couldn't write, some uh, could only draw uh, their story that they were writing in their head. Uh, but a lot of feedback came from those kids. And uh, afterwards, the caretakers uh, told me like they were all happy, although they, they are uh, suffering severe depression they became more happy and uh, they started to be interested in reading your books and some uh, were um, getting the books at the library and reading them. So they want to do it uh, again next year. And uh, so I was really happy. <laughs> so you can use it also uh, for this kind of stuff, for healing, actually, mentally healing. Yeah. So I don't know if the two gentlemen have questions. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh... Not sure as a question, but first, thank you for a fascinating, fascinating talk. I'm, a, I think that since childhood, I'm a, a huge fan of fantasy and science fiction. I think this is like 95% of what I have read in my whole lifetime is of this genre. And uh, maybe more than 90% uh, 90, 90 starting from comics when I was a teenager and all the classics of science fiction and fantasy. This was my kind of, uh, and till today, always searching for something new. So, uh, and also this project of, of that we are in now in this Buckminster College, it's I think to in a large, to a large part, it was also conceived having some kind of fantastic uh, thinking in mind, starting from Buckminster Fuller, uh, 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 Spaceship Earth, and other books like uh, Diamond Age, uh, Neil Stephenson Diamond Age, about this amazing technology, which is a uh, a book, a nanotechnological book that that adapts to the learner at every single uh, step. And um, so this is really something that this is some essential source to everything that we are having in mind in terms of of having this school is. A lot to do with the uh, imagination and fantastic uh, fantasy science fiction. I was quite quite um, intrigued that you don't even make a clear distinction between science fiction and fantasy, which is like a very classical uh, division, and you just went between uh, the two of them as if it's uh, one uh, single genre, which I agree to. Uh, one thing that came to my mind while listening to you was uh, uh, I would say it's it's a very respected subgenre in the in fantasy. It's what is called I think it was mostly conceived in South America, but but not only it was we call uh, fantastic realism, like uh, Borges, uh, Gracia Marquez. And I'm particularly interested in this in connection of in connection of the Buckminster College project is whether we can create with the materials that you were uh, mentioning a, a kind of an immersive environment where this fiction and reality becoming like intermingled with each other 
And like the learning, the learning experience which is happening um, concretely is also becoming part of a story that uh, and the students and the instructors are both like of course concrete humans that are having uh, concrete experiences and the uh, events of communication, teaching, uh, learning, etc. but also being part of a story being weaved all along as something that like really blurs the it blurs the um, the boundaries between like concrete reality and the uh, rims of imagination making them uh, making them uh, much less uh, distinct for, uh, from each other and i think this could be amazing and the materials that you were mentioning just pump them with some vitamins or uh, hormones to make them <laughs> to make to make it something i think that um, what was uh, what people found so fascinating in uh, books like uh, Harry Potter that there was the idea of like a school which is happening and mingling uh, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, it's like a fantastic realism uh, uh, kind of genre where reality and imagination are being intermingled. But there it's a book about, and what I would like to have just, uh, it's, it's a dream uh, to have something like this <clears throat> really happening with real people, with real, real students, real instructors, and somehow find the channels of how to connect this together. So, and, yes. uh, and it can be a very challenging and interesting an interesting um, aspect or dimension of what what we try to do. It is. And people with such an ex learning experience uh, going to the world and were envisioning, envisioning as bridging between con concrete, reali concrete reality and imagination is something uh -huh. which is readily available in the everyday life in all situations, whatever, yes. Uh -huh. um, yes, I think, yes, I, I think, for example, um, there's also a kind of writing ex exercise where you can write about yourself as a person in a story. So, yeah. for example, you could uh, have a group of young people writing together their own story you know and because of writing about it they start to reflecting about it and yeah. think about what they are doing and that is helping them to uh, you know keep holding the focus on whatever their goal is or something or the pro or solving a problem or healing or whatever they want to do um it's something you can do it's um, a bit like owning your own story it's like uh, having control about what you are doing and you're in control and you can mix it with um with indeed to this uh, this fantasy aspect like the harry potter uh, thing it's it's called urban fantasy because it's playing in our world in our universe not uh, on another planet uh, for example um and a lot of young people uh, love to read that so I uh, think that maybe these uh, students will also be attracted to write it, actually. And in the process of writing, they will there will pop up new questions. Uh, it can be about research. It can be about other projects they work about. And then they can go um, further working on these other projects. And it can there can be an interaction between it. Maybe something like that could work. Yes, I, I recall that uh, quite a while ago, uh... In a conversation with Marta, actually, we even before the website was existing, it was uh, like a question: Okay, uh, the people that you mentioned, Elon Musk. Uh, so we were we were speculating about this: that the people that will go uh, as the first explorer and the um, uh, not immigrants, how you call it. Um, 
settlers. Settlers. The first settlers yes. on Mars are the children of today. So yes. the question that we were asking, okay, so what kind of education, what kind of knowledge, what kind of a social fabric and all sorts of questions, how can we prepare such people uh, to go and live on Mars, which is like a microcosm of what is happening on this planet, but hopefully more informed, more conscious and more... Uh, um, interesting, beautiful, and, and this was one of uh, one of the speculations that we were talking about of how to uh, how to go about this uh, invention, basically invention of educational uh, trajectory and invention of a school and even now I was I would be very curious to figure how a group of gifted children will be posed with this question and they will have to uh, come up with ideas, both fictional and realistic of how do they want, how do they see or want or desire a learning trajectory that will lead to something like this or can be of course not um, so that's a uh, kind of and they will need a lot of problem solving uh yeah problems. yes yeah it's... i'm gonna stop ah okay now we can see each other again yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so if, if so... i can jump in uh, just just a, a few words about this blurring about reality like the boundaries of reality it's, it's indeed something like we are you know like playing with and uh, interestingly, you know, like I'm now scheduling the seminars uh, in in the CLEA seminar series, which is on Fridays. You are most welcome to, to join already for the fall. And uh, there will be like three seminars in a row about uh, something that people are busy with. They call it world making, which is like it has become a, a very interesting field of both research and design thinking, and it connects, you know, like uh, writing and uh, game development, but also like reality creation. So I think like what, what we are speaking actually about, you know, like one, one thing is indeed learning to, to write, and another is to like co-create the space, the project, yes, that it like becomes like a story like this, yes, so like, the, like, like this word. But this reminds me of a question I wanted to bring to you, uh, from the uh, Facebook page, I have I have announced the the seminar, uh, today's seminar, and one of the people there uh, uh, following us on on Facebook asked this question, and I thought, okay, it's, it will be good to to bring bring it to you because the question, or rather maybe a complaint, was that like, do are we really sure? Because yes, yes, it's fantastic. It's like that. I mean, like fun, it's good. <laughs> this whole fantasy and, and, and maybe beautiful and so on but is it really something that uh, that we want to advance in humanity and not the other way around like l learning to be in reality to see in reality to understand reality uh, because otherwise you know people live in those like fantasy bubble and here comes the story about the fake news and everything conspiracy theories we, we, we fabricate realities, we live in those bubbles. How about like meeting in reality? So how would you respond to this? Are you unmuted? Oh. Yeah. So thinking about that, uh, it's indeed, you know, I started to think about that uh, when um, the, the was the incident with the Capitol in the United States. And you remember this one guy, he was like a shaman, yes. And I was thinking about how many fantasy books did this guy read? Um, what was the influence of books like The Hunger Games? We had a lot of dystopian work published in the United States uh, in the past decade. Uh, what was the influence on that? It really started me thinking. And that was the idea of the, the farmer of thoughts. We plant uh, certain thoughts in the people's head. And that is why in my last book, I was writing also a dystopian work. I actually decided not to um, go the road of the rebellion, 
you know. So I have this dystopian world. I have this young couple who wants to rebel against the dictator. And the war doesn't come like you are used to. And going into the process of, of battling um, the, yes, all, all this, this kind of difficult situations they are in, they learn that uh, it is better to work together, even if you do not always agree, than to you uh, fight a fight with so many deaths and so many. So I read that was really um, a conscious choice to to write it that way. Uh, but indeed, it's really an interesting thing. Um, our imagination is working uh, as well positive as negative, and it's. I think it's really very important to um, develop high gifted people to people who make the right choice. Because this is about choice, and it's about how you, what you learn them on a moral level. What is good? What is evil? Because with high intelligence comes power. It is actually it's about handling power, and imagination is power as well. It's a weapon. It can be a weapon, and it's the, the way you handle it that will define you, actually. And that's a really important thing. Yes, and it's something that I think we need we need to think about in the education of these kids. Uh, I, I always said to my husband, the, the biggest challenge is to, to uh, raise these kids to become good people, to uh, become people who will totally and free, willingly make the right choices for this world and not just for them, you know? Um, and that's a difficult one, I think, certainly. And, uh, yeah, in, in how society is developing now, indeed, with uh, completely out of balance, and you have the extreme left and extreme uh, right and all the fake news. And that is a big question. That And how to solve that? I do not know it yet. <laughs> Maybe one day we will find an answer to that. But um, I don't know if anybody else has ideas about how we can approach this problem. Uh, yes, this is, this is uh, sorry. What did you want to say? No, not uh, I have no answer on, on the last question you said, but but I'm I'm thinking about the writing down of it. Oh, this is very important, and and I see you, what you try to explain. But what about storytelling? I I use the technique of imagination, fantasy, uh, reality, not so real reality. Um, of not the reality everybody can see, but together in storytelling. So so with with young people and with adults, and then to to let them look at the world in another way. Mm -hmm. So and in the tradition of the the, uh, the the indigenous peoples, it's all about storytelling. It's not about writing it down because tomorrow we tell another story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with, with other people and and but. Of course, the, the 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 basics of the fundamentals are the same, but but and and how important it is to write it down, and and mm -hmm. and, and the, the 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 creativity, the stimulation, the working together with storytelling is is also working together. Yes, I think the writing down is important um, because actually it's a bit slower, mm. and you are slowing down your thinking by writing it down. And sometimes we need that uh, because we are actually forced to take the time to think about everything more than uh, when we make, uh, I don't know, images or pictures or whatever. Mm. Um, for example, uh, one exercise I do with my students is that they must copy a part of the text and there are quite long sentences in it. And then there are short sent sentences in it. It's about rhythm, but they have to write it uh, by hand, <laughs> not typing. Uh, and then you see them really struggling. Oh my God, it's a long sentence. Because when you write it uh, by hand, it's slow. You're slowing down and you feel how slow it goes. And uh, and meanwhile, there comes space for, for other thoughts, you know? So for me, that's why writing is important. But of course, today, uh, there are so mixed techniques for storytelling. Uh, we have sound, we have image, we have uh, the uh, theater and, and the mix between all of that in a live show. So there's a lot, uh, many ways of storytelling. 
and all of them have different accents. Um, for example, when you have a moving uh, image and then film, um, the dialogues are less important. It's what you show, and we uh, mm. we pick in images very fast in our brain. We um, we actually analyze it also very fast. So you don't have that slowing down thing <laughs> when you are writing. That's that's the thing. Um, and why the reading? Uh, because when you have the reading process in your mind, um, it's quite more challenging for your brain than watching a movie, for example. Um, when you um, when you watch a movie, you always, always already have the process of imaging. You know, you don't have to do that by yourself. When you are reading a book, actually, your brain starts to process an image in your mind. Um, and with fantasy, that's much more difficult than uh, when you are just writing, uh, re reading another uh, work of fiction. If I tell you about my uh, Mercedes car type, I don't know what, and you you know what you know that type of car immediately, you have the the image of that car in your mind. If I'm talking to you about some futuristic car that doesn't exist and you have never seen, uh, and you have to you know process an image of it, it's it's quite more challenging for your mind. So. Um, a lot of people, therefore, uh, find fantasy and sci-fi sometimes difficult to read. Uh, and one of the best experiences I ever had was in a, in a reading club. And there was a lady, uh, she was 90 years old. And um, she had, uh, she read my book and she said to me, um, oh, she said, it was interesting, but really my head was tired. <laughs> it was, and I found that so beautiful because she was, she was so old. And she was writing, as she was reading fantasy, which I, I thought that amazing and wonderful. Uh, and then she said to me, "This like it, it. I was feeling tired, more tired when I was reading this fantasy book than another book. My brain actually needed to work harder." It was the best example. Um, for example, we we also have projects uh, where we go reading with uh, people with dementia and Alzheimer. Um, and then you, you see them really reviving and, and reacting on the language and the process of reading, and it still works with, for them. So I think it is important that we still read uh, really written stories without images. <laughs> uh, but of course, yes, the, the, yeah, there are so many ways of storytelling today, and um, they are, yeah, it's, it's not easy always to uh, convince people to read again just because reading takes more time and it's slowly and yeah my children once said to me why do we have to read the harry potter books if we can watch the movie you know <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes I, so, I i want to i want to say something uh, um there is a, about uh, what uh, uh, whether eric said and what you said i think that there are uh, two approaches here that both are needs to be in synergy and both are important. Uh, I, the, there was a movie, a, quite an old movie uh, called In Search of Bobby Fisher. It's about a child, a, a a, like a Mavery gifted child in chess. And he has two teachers. One teacher is, uh, I think it's Ben Kingsley and he teaches him discipline memorization, strategy, long-term thinking, and such. And, and he forces him to just play all games without a board and without, uh, without uh, the game pieces. And there is another teacher, which is Lawrence Fishbourne, I believe, that is like an homeless from the Central Park. And he's teaching that same child to play blitz games, like you have to play a whole game in like five minutes or seven minutes, and then you don't have time to think. You have to operate your um, your immediate uh, sensibility, your intuitive knowledge. And this was qu quite fascinating how these two are coming together in order to create mastership. So I believe in this sense, like something which is very spontaneous that comes uh, in in uh, storytelling, 
and challenging somebody to tell a story uh, in real time and writing down something which is thoughtful and taking into consideration world development, character development, and storyline development, both of them are very important. Now, this is one thing that I wanted to say. Second thing is to come back, come back to the question that uh, Martha started this uh, small discussion is uh, reality and imagination and what is more important. So of course it's a question of balance and and uh, my first answer, I have two, uh, two answers to this that are kind of complementary. The first answer is that uh, we cannot remain in this dichotomy between imagination and reality without adding a third factor in our uh, everyday uh, cognitive function, which is consciousness. And this is the third element. And there is always, by facilitated by consciousness, this movement between, uh, uh, between uh, what is called reality and the so-called imagination and how you move between one and the other, and how you can um, harness them into something which works together in a very empowering manner. And I think the consciousness here is it's, it's, the, it's the third element, but it's also a meta element that we hope to find ways how to how to teach or how to expose a, a young student to the possibility of moving between the two. This is one part of the answer that I would give. A second part of the answer uh, to the one that uh, asked uh, that asked this question, and it's it's very nice. It's also with a smile because. If we really think deeply about the distinction between what is real and what is imaginary, it's a lot a work of our imagination. This, this boundary between the two is also a work of our imagination. Think, I get up in the morning and I have to go to work in order to make a living for myself, for my family, etc. This is an idea. It's not real. It's not written anywhere. It's not written in the trees. It doesn't. It's not written in the in the in the mountains. It's not written in the in the atmosphere. It's it's an imagined thing. It's and, and most of our what is the so-called uh, real world that we live in is full of this. Yes, it's it's all a work of our imagination and. If we do not become, if we do not become really aware and conscious to this, and the, the distinction between reality and imagination is itself something that we can move and play with. Well, this is, I think, this is one of the most important ideas here. And so, if if we go, what is real reality? Real, real the real, real, most rock bottom rock bottom uh, uh, concrete reality, okay, I need to breathe, I need to eat, I need to drink in order to survive, and it goes all down to our biological needs. And the biological needs is probably the only constraint that we have that defines a certain line or a certain contour of what is concrete reality. And even this line is being, is being worked out and changed by many people that makes it interesting for them uh, to like people that can dive and not breathe for like uh, seven, eight minutes, uh, et cetera, et cetera, just by the power of their own imagination. And, and even given that, that we go to this, very rock bottom concrete boundary of what is real, I don't think that any sensible person wants to live there because there it's survival, it's self-interest, 
and it's like the um, the precepts of of uh, of uh, evolution of evolution meaning survival procreation and then <coughs> Of course it exists, but this is, I'm not sure that this is where we want to place the, the, the contour, the, the one that asked it, I don't think that this was what was meant because uh, we have society, we have culture, we have things that that were created in, created in order to enlarge this scope of our ex existence and the way that we enlarge it is always a work of our imagination. So this is a bit a bit long, but this is a, if anyone, if a, if the person that was asking it will care to go and <laughs> see if there is an answer to it. I I think this is like a beginning of okay. how to go about it. That's a... sorry. What did you say? Um, because I think um, we are constantly reshaping reality um, by the image of our imagination. I mean, everything yeah. around us, um, my pen, my clothes, my, I don't know, the door behind me, it always started in the mind of somebody. That's yeah. it. It's only planet Earth and the animals who didn't. And even that because we have breeding programs and we influence even that. So um, we are so deeply connected with this planet and our imagination has influenced it so quite badly sometimes. Um, you, you cannot, I don't know, we are just, it's one system. Um, for example, I, I was reading this article about new conglomerates uh, on remote islands and uh, it's it's a rock farming forming in the ocean uh, with plastic in it it's like plastic rock so this is one of the fundamental <laughs> processes in the earth and we have influenced it because of our imagination and scientific okay. knowledge so it goes so far uh, so i think our imagination for me is the most powerful thing we have and it can save us but it can also destroy us yes. and what it will be i don't know i hope uh, the first thing but um it definitely it's so important to um to train people to use it and to to yeah to to train them to become uh, to make the right choices actually and that's that's a really challenge we have made a lot of wrong choices in the past uh for this world and uh, and it just it's because of the power of our imagination things are so bad right now so <laughs> um that's yes, a many of the bad choices many of the bad choices are actually failure of imagination and yeah not, and not like a work of imagination but failure of imagination is mm -hmm. where where people fall back into this very uh, a very very basic biological imperatives of survival, self-interest, and all means of uh, like evolution, evolutionary um, uh, constraints and precepts. And so, yes, this is like a lot of the, a lot of the bad choices is like failure of imagination and not like the triumph of, mm -hmm of our envisioning and imagination. Yeah, it is. Okay, thank you all for this. I have to go now, but see you soon. Okay, bye. Bye, bye Eric. I, I also just like th towards wrapping up, you know, like I, I, it seems to me that what, what we are coming back and I very much like what, what you Pen said and also what, what we were kind of like came back to from, from the other side, you know, because we are like returning to this, to this, to this figure of kind of transcendry, transcending uh, dichotomies in like in, in many different ways. Yeah. So, so even what you said first about this, you know, like morality shaping, and I, I like, I like this moment you had, okay, do I, do I come, like, do I, uh, you know, 
Am I responsible? Or not, you know? Yeah. And because it was like, yeah, in the old days, it was to be simplistic, you know, good and bad. And, you know, and there is this, 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 you know, regime and there is us. And by, by, the, by default, us is good, you know? And like, this is the default, you know, like setup, yes? But, uh, and uh, yeah, so so the, the thing is, you know, like, uh, and and then you know like this structure that taken from the story like the fairy tales from childhood you know and and through the religions and through the like physical existence of a body which has a, this like boundary me not me this is a very strong you know like thought uh, uh, structure yes this like yes or no good good and bad and uh, and then you can apply it to anything and you 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 would think that education is like pointing to one side of any distinction and saying this you know so for example we do fantasy you know ah uh, reality not important we do the, like it's like it's always the same structure which is over simplistic yes which is like actually if you, if we speak about evil this is the structure of evil not the one who is on the other side of you but the very like this, you know, doing that you do, you know, and and then you you, you just stay on one side, yes. It's yeah, when you separate like, yourself, you know, yes. So so in education, yes, like our our job here is to teach. We were calls it now consciousness, but you can call it like whatever. It's like being intelligent in dealing with the dichotomy without forsaking any body yeah and anything yeah so uh and and what what you say that okay uh, uh, they are they are like living in this dystopian uh reality and they don't choose the rebellion path yeah and they uh it's it's such a powerful shift which is all, all like also like visible you know like even like what what it reminded me what you what you said is this this uh where the matrix series went you know and the the fourth uh the fourth uh installment this this beautiful uh line the meaning of us has changed uh, which i love from this from this movie you know like it's it's not like them and us you know like what was us yes and uh and uh, it's it's something also you know like we have to work it out together whatever you cut out you have to come back to it yes it's also us yes and uh, and that becomes more difficult more complex yes and and uh, and then actually the power of uh, of literature is to kind of bring those thought structures but more complex yes to to you know like that people are like thinking in those in those ways yes so yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting and also how do you translate that to education i think there's a difference between being intelligent and then intelligent behavior you know there's a two different things it's not because you're, you're smart you're acting smart and that's something that uh, we need to learn them they will have to yeah, learn intelligent behavior and on all uh, levels of life and humanity. It's about making choices about life and death. It is about making choices about taking care for people, about uh, treating other people with respect. You know, um, if you are uh, if you have a, a good imagination, you can also use it to um, to imagine how somebody else is feeling. So you, with, if you can do that in a better way, uh, you can find a way to not hurt somebody, you know, that would help society. Certainly the society like she is now is really hard and sometimes without any mercy uh, for anybody. So um, then that's something that's re something really is bothering me. <laughs> so as a writer as well, when I write, I also uh, try to think about that mm -hmm. and how my characters will develop. Um, and it's about everything. It's about religion. It's about gender. It's uh, also the gender roles. So, so it's something very important. If you think about it, how we influence people from childhood to think, uh, like, for example, um, I saw this movie about uh, children when we give them um, toys for girls and toys for boys, you know, even uh, in the um, three months uh, you can you switch the toys you can already see differences in the, the brain development it's just so it's it's really 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 very interesting in how this is all influencing each other and that is something that we also need to think about uh with these kids like how are we going to treat them 
what kind of, of subjects are we going to give to them for research? Uh, how are we going to guide them uh, so that they, yeah, that they learn to uh, behave intellectual or not only be intellectual? Hmm. Maybe one last question uh, I have. I'm I'm curious about mm -hmm. actually two que two questions. <laughs> one is, did you have any uh, adventure or initial adventure with something like ChatGPT in writing? No. What do you think about? Ah, no. So no, I, I did. I refused to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really I don't want to be influenced uh, by it actually um I want my my work to to be me you know uh and completely originally be me and I'm really it kind of frightens me that uh when this this machine is regenerating things because that's what's doing it's regenerating recombining ideas of others actually um how oh, and, and I was also, but also thinking. Also, you are the you are directing it. Yes, it's not like yeah. for a bit. Eh? So, so uh, it's not entirely autonomous it, in this sense. Uh, I, I don't want to allow it to influence me and my thinking. Uh, I, I guess uh, I want to keep this mind clear and and for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't used it okay. not yet. <laughs> Maybe one day, but no, <laughs> at the moment, no. Um, yeah. It's, okay, it's, come to my seminar in a couple of weeks because I'm going to speak about it. Uh, okay, maybe it'll be will, interesting. Yeah, I'm interested. You will, you will be convinced otherwise. That, so this was one question. The, and one last question, what is to your mind the best fantasy or science fiction book you ever read? Oh, that's a difficult one. Um... <laughs> I actually, I have, yeah, maybe I will if, find something new because I'm searching stuff to. I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, one of the, I think the best fantasy series I ever read was uh, Mistborn by Brandon Sanderson. Sorry again, yeah. Uh, Mistborn. Mistborn. Yes, by Brandon Sanderson. Um, no, it's because um, he writes books who are have many layers. They are complex. And he thinks through every aspect of uh, his world building and his character building uh, really deeply. He dives in deeply at every every aspect of the writing, at every aspect of the world building. And uh, if you you must read the whole series, the, the three books of them, and it's the the end is wonderful. Um, the content is wonderful. Um, it's, it's from what uh, from what year is it? It's ah, uh, uh, it's uh, I think from from mm, ten yeah. years ago, ten ten twelve years ago. And it's, I think. it's one world missed bomb. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a yeah, series. So... It's a series of three books. So yeah. And another Most one I think is a series of three books right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the next one that I really like is uh, The Dark Tower. Uh, it's uh, by Stephen King. Dark Tower, yeah, Dark Tower. Yes, okay. yes it's also you read all the all the series of Dark Tower. It's uh, this guy from uh, uh, how is um, forgot his name now. Uh, Stephen King. Stephen, yes, Stephen, Stephen King. King yes. yes, yes, it's about seven books and already a few others as well. But I, I like the world building because it's it's completely uh, original. Um, I like the the quality of the storytelling. Uh, but that's Stephen King. Eh? He can write an entire book uh, about just one day. <laughs> so um, yes. I think that the second, the second of, or the third book in the series, it's it, it's the sign of three, and it's about it. It really plays on one beach, uh, twenty four hours on one beach, and. The yeah, main was... character, yeah, he steps through doors and guess, he ends yes. up in the minds of people in our world. Uh, very different characters as well. And it's really fascinating. Uh, it's really good storytelling. Oh, cool. yes. Yeah. The world has moved on. That's yes, the... it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, anything else you would like to add, Juan? Or... Uh, no, I'm actually, I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you very 
happy to have this. I very much enjoyed this this conversation. Yes, yes I did. I did. So as well. please keep coming back, you know. And and I I am I'm sure that in the September workshop, you know, we'll be working a lot. Uh, yeah, uh, already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because as as I said, like the, the this whole workshop, uh, which will be like on educational techniques, methods, you know, skills. Yeah, we will center on uh, integration, you know, like when you have like the challenge will be you have this class, this class, this class, this class, combine it together into one hour constellation. OK, yeah. So you like, you know, like we can we can furnish the entire school with your materials, basically, because it's such a wonderful platform for integration. And it will be doing different things as well. Yes, but but definitely, def definitely. Yeah. I'm definitely coming. It's on location, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can finally meet in real life. Yeah, yeah. It will yeah be I'm really looking forward to that. It will be in Brussels at the at the VUB, and like in in a few weeks, uh, I promise there will be something already <laughs> sent out. But but in June still we have two seminars coming. In two weeks we have one uh, uh, from a researcher of uh, homeschooling. And he has interesting yes, that. observations about what's happening in Belgium, how those like two systems come together, the, the homeschooling and, and normal uh, normal schooling, whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, the, the normal regular school trajectory they follow. Traditional, yeah, traditional. Uh, and and two weeks later is Weaver's seminar about how we are going to play with the new kids on the block. Yes, meaning the generative AIs of all sorts, and like you know, yeah. but enter the scene. It's interesting to hear your answer about about this. Uh, okay, let's let's talk. Yeah, I don't have it yet. Yes, it's, uh -huh. it's yeah, created yeah. in the coming days, weeks. Yes. <laughs> well, now you will be influenced by her answer about not wanting to be influenced. You know? Yes, yes. People do that too. Not only AI, yeah, it just influence each other. <laughs> so thank you so much, Pan. I, uh, yeah, I thank you. Really uh, happy about about your talk, and uh, I hope we'll have more uh, opportunities in the future. Yes, I hope so as well. Thank you very much also for the opportunity and for uh, organizing everything, you know. <laughs> yes.